Good morning, church. Let me be one of the first to tell you Happy New Year. We made it to 2021. Can I get an amen? Amen. Watch, that is the best response I'm going to get all sermon this morning. Um, in all serious no, seriousness, though, we, we all know, right, the, the temptation around New Year's Day, kind of, we've already touched upon it, right, is to cast vision, right, is to pick out big goals, to pick something to strive towards next year. I mean, we all do it, right? We pick out, um, we're all looking for a quick fix. We all pick out whatever we think is the biggest problem in our life, and we set out to eliminate it. Right? Thinking that if we can, we can fix this one thing, then maybe, maybe we're going to finally be satisfied with our life. I mean, we all do it, right? Think of your res- resolution last year. How did, how did it turn out? If we're being honest, probably not great, right? Some statistics show that about 90% of the New Year's resolutions fail. And the majority of those fail by the second week in February, And so if we're being honest, it seems like every year falls short of the expectations we set for it. Either we don't achieve what we set out to achieve, or we do, but it doesn't really bring the satisfaction that we think it's going to bring. But but, but let me not um, disillusion you this morning. This is about more than just a New Year's resolution. I'm not going to sit up here and dog New Year's resolutions all sermon, but as a people, we're more prosperous than ever. Right, the average American today enjoys a lifestyle, a way of living that the wealthiest of Americans 200 years ago could never have imagined. Yet as prosperity has increased, so has things such as depression, suicide, almost in sync, in fact. In fact, some estimate that there are roughly 10 times as many diagnosed cases of depression as there were 50 years ago. And according to polls, this year, right, 2020, this year, Americans' mental health has dropped to an all-time low. We're a society of unfulfilled, unsatisfied, depressed people. And and the reason I bring all of this up this morning is that this new year, more than ever, everybody's looking for a quick fix, right? Maybe it's the vaccine, right? We're going to get these vaccines, and everything's going to go back to normal. COVID is just going to go away. Maybe it's the elections falling a certain way. Oh, so-and-so is going to get in office. So-and-so is going to have power over Congress. And we'll all be good. Maybe it's just the calendar year changing, right? But we're going to see this morning that if we're looking for a quick fix, we're looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place. And so if you would, flip to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 for me. It's just two books after Psalms. Uh, that's where we're going to be this morning. And, and God is going to use Solomon. He's going to, in his word, he's going to use Solomon to show us that very truth. That there's no quick fix for our lack of contentment. And so, for some background, the book of Ecclesiastes is written by King Solomon, right? And as you may know, King Solomon is the dude who God gave wisdom, right? He's extremely wise, extremely wealthy, extremely successful, right? One of the richest men in the world at the time, had 400 wives, 700 concubines. As you may know that he had all of these things, but what you may not know is that towards the end of his life, he fell away from God and into idolatry. And this book was written towards the end of his life when he was far from God. And the topic of this book is one that many of us have probably tossed around in our mind before. What's the meaning of life? What's the point? Specifically, life here on earth, because remember, Solomon is far away from God. He doesn't have an eternal perspective. He doesn't see heaven and at the end of his search, he, er, he sets out in this book to, to find what is the point. And he goes through all of these things, right? And he explains how he tried everything that the world has to offer, yet at the end of his search, it's all meaningless. It's all pointless. And we as readers can see that he was looking in the wrong place the entire time. And so if you would, um, join with me in Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 11, and he's going to set up the thesis, the point of the rest of the book to follow. Read with me. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun sets, and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full." 
to the place where the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye is never enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Let's pray real quick. God, thank you for your word this morning. Please help to open our minds and our hearts to the truth that you have for us. God, please speak through me and do what only you can do this morning. We love you and we praise you and we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So Solomon starts out the book by proclaiming the meaningless and the vanity of life. Real cheery stuff, right? But he later goes on to expound on these claims and talk more about it in chapter 1 and 2. And as I said earlier, remember, he sets out and and tries to see what life has to offer. And he goes through the big three, right? Knowledge, pleasure, and success. And he explains how each of these things as a pursuit in order to find fulfillment have failed. And and it has to be said that he's not condemning these three things in and of themselves, but he is condemning them as a source of fulfillment. And how he pursued these three things may look a little bit different. I hope nobody's walking around today with 400 wives and 700 concubines. Um, But don't be fooled. The world still chases after these very three things. There's nothing new under the sun. Right? Think about recent history. Right? Think about the 60s. There were a time filled with new philosophy, skepticism of government, skepticism of everything imaginable. And then as the 60s faded out and the 70s came in, the philosophy fizzled and it led to the drug-fueled hedonism, right? Drugs, disco, everything the flesh can desire. And then you move to the 80s where they're left empty again and now the group called the yuppies take over to pursue wealth, success, power. And so the cycle continues. The most prosperous country in the world spins its wheels. Stock market jumps, and so does suicide and depression. How long until we realize that it is never going to work? 1 John 2.16 says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Right, and Solomon doesn't bash all of these things without giving you a reason why, right? The whole book later on expands on why these things don't work out. And we could get to the nitty gritty of each of these, but we don't really have time this morning, right? But I mean, you know, success leads to selfishness. Pleasure is fleeting. But while we don't have time to touch on every little detail, we have the time to touch on one common flaw in every single pursuit. And this common flaw is actually probably one of the most glaring of all. And that's at the end of each of these pursuits is the same thing. It's death. We all die. There's no escaping it. And and I saw an illustration as I was studying for this of a balloon. So if you see me preach before, you know I have props. And so I got to grab my prop real quick. And he uses this illustration of a balloon. And he says, think of work, money, or pleasure as balloons. We fill them with our time, our energy, our hope, and for a while we watch them expand, right? And it almost appears like there's some mass and some weight, right? It looks like there's something here. But inside it's only vapor, and death is the needle that shows that truth. And see, without understanding that, we assume that the reason we're unsatisfied is because we haven't arrived yet. We think we're going to be happy if we can just reach that goal we set for ourselves, We medicate our symptoms by doubling down on the buying, the pleasure-seeking, the work, like it's actually going to fix anything. We just keep blowing more and more air into the balloon. But the problem isn't what we haven't achieved. It's not that we haven't arrived. The problem is where we're going. So sure, we can live it up, make all the money we want, gather all the knowledge, but it won't change a single thing about how your life on earth comes to a close. It's all just a balloon bound to pop. And so Solomon's answer in Ecclesiastes to this conundrum is to find contentment in life, right? And so if you follow along in chapter 2, verse 22 through 25, it says, what do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. 
A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? So be content. Great, guys. Sermon over. Everybody go enjoy your new year. Hungry horse, dog and pony. Beat the other churches there. That's the answer. No, obviously not, right? There's more to it. How do we actually be content in this world? Well, Ecclesiastes doesn't really give us that answer. We have to understand that Ecclesiastes, Solomon is just giving us the negative side of the equation. He's looking around and saying, look, none of this works. Nothing here on earth works. It doesn't satisfy. And so this then creates a natural response of, well, what does? And so C.S. Lewis has a quote where he basically says, people don't have desires unless satisfaction for that desire exists. A baby feels hunger and there's food. A duck wants to swim and there's water. There's a desire for physical intimacy and there's sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, it doesn't prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly measures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. Listen, the fact that we long for something more is evidence that there actually is something more. Solomon writes that God has set eternity in man's heart. Romans 8, verses 20 through 21 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, or vanity, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You know what this means? It means this was all part of the plan. It plainly says that God subjected creation to futility. He made life on earth unsatisfying. There's no quick fix because God made it that way. Why? Well, life was never made to fulfill us in the first place. Our fulfillment has always been meant to be found in God. Even pre-fall, life was the gift. But Adam and Eve, in, in the, the original sin, they chose creation over the creator. And so the curse in Genesis 3, God made life for man toilsome and futile. Man chose creation over God, and so God showed man what creation was like without him as to draw man back to himself. By us not feeling satisfied with what's in front of us, we're compelled to ask for something more, to seek for something more, with that something more being God himself. Adam and Eve said, God, we don't need you, we don't want you, and then God showed them life without him. The gift of life, pleasure, knowledge, success, possessions, it's totally meaningless without a relationship with the perfect giver. Think about a gift, right? That was once sentimental from a boyfriend, a girlfriend, right? When you first get it, there's all this meaning and this joy, and then the relationship is broken. And not only has that gift lost its wonderful meaning, but now it's a harsh reminder of the relationship that once was. And so our life here on earth is a sharp reminder of the perfect life that we were created for with God. However, that pain... That longing we feel serves a purpose. It draws us back to him. It's a drawing back that leads us to Jesus Christ. And we find the conclusion of this in Philippians 4. Paul picks back up this idea of contentment in Christ. When Paul's writing Philippians, he's sitting in a Roman jail, chained to a guard, could be executed any minute. But what he writes is one of the most clear instructions on how to be content and satisfied in the whole Bible. And okay, so if I've lost you up to this point, I, come back to me, right? If your neighbor's asleep, give him a nice little elbow in the ribs. I'm giving you permission. Just, just kidding, kind of. But this is the answer. This is the whole point. Everything in this sermon has been building up to this. This is the answer. The secret of contentment. Philippians 4, 11 through 13 says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do all 
things through him who strengthens me. Amen. Wow. Would you look at the contrast here between Paul and Solomon? Solomon has everything in the world. Rich beyond all comprehension. Wisest man on earth. 400 rods, 700 concubines. Everything he wanted. Anything he could do whenever he wanted, however he wanted. And he hated his life. He was miserable. Said it would have been better to never been born. Then look at Paul. In jail. Chained to a guard. Has nothing. Been shipwrecked. Been chased out of towns been beaten within an inch of his life to the point they actually thought he was dead. And he's the happiest dude on the block. Why? Because he knew the secret. He found his contentment in Jesus. Paul didn't look to his worldly circumstances to find his fulfillment. Whatever the circumstances, he found his fulfillment in the person of Christ. In Christ's finished work on the cross. He embraced what he wrote about back in Romans 8.20, the freedom and the glory of being a child of God. He said he was content no matter his circumstances, well-fed, hungry, much, little. It was enough for Paul that Christ died for him. He died for his sins. He's justified by the blood of Jesus. That he's adopted into the family of God. This is the same guy who wrote in Ephesians that we've received every spiritual blessing through Christ, redemption through his blood, a holy inheritance in heaven. And so church, we can finally find fulfillment, not in anything in this life, but in the one who created this life. And listen, this is the craziest thing. The more we find our fulfillment in Christ, the more we're rightly able to enjoy life without trying to milk some satisfaction out of it that was never there in the first place. When we don't look for stuff down here to complete us, we're fine whether we have it or not. And so earlier I may have shared, I, I may not have, but this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to me, right? That's because a few weeks back, my wife and I caught COVID and we were locked up right before Thanksgiving. Um, had nothing to do, and it gave me some time to reflect. And I realized that if you were to look over my life, you would see this big cycle of always having to look forward to some next big event or some next big moment. I always have to look forward to something. I, I never could be content with where I was at. You know, as a kid, it could be something as simple as like a vacation or going to my grandparents' house. And as a teenager, it's summer, it's football season, college. It always changed, but it, it's always the same. Even this past year, it was my wife and I, we were graduating college. We were supposed to get married, this real cool venue, this awesome cruise for a honeymoon, right? And then we were moving here. And of course, that's the year it all came crashing down, right? And it was all great, but nothing went according to plan. Everything looked different. And as I was sitting there locked up, I just felt God showing me the, the foolishness of my need to always have to strive towards something. It's like he told me, Garrett, Am I not enough? Is it not enough to just sit here and rest in the fact that I died for you? It's like a revelation. And now obviously we're back to doing things, right? At some level of normalcy, but my perspective has changed and I'm, I'm thankful God allows me to have plans, allows me to look forward to things, but I realize even if he doesn't, I'm good. And listen, this is just me but this is true for all of us. We all have some sort of thing we're striving towards, but all of us can just rest in the fact that, that we are Christ's. This is true of all believers. Our contentment doesn't change no matter the circumstances. So what do we do with this? Right? How do we actually put this into practice? Well, let me start with this. And I hope I don't, actually kind of do hope I step on some toes because I know this stepped on my toes. If you weren't content in 2020, you're not going to magically be content in 2021. Amen. None's going to change. Right. Your marriage struggled because you had to spend a lot of time together. Still married. Same person. Anxious about world events. <laughs> it ain't slowing down anytime soon. There's no quick fix coming. 
Quick fixes don't fill the void. They don't solve the problem. And listen, I'm, I'm not sitting here saying that we shouldn't try to improve things in our life. Listen, go lose that weight. Go get that promotion. Go kick that bad habit. Those can be good things. They aren't bad, but they won't fix your life. They aren't the answer. The answer is the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I understand that some of you are sitting there going, sure, okay, so you're telling me to just wake up and decide that I'm content? Sure. <laughs> and, and I don't just want to leave you with some lofty spiritual churchy phrases. So how do we learn to find our contentment in Christ? Well, it's not just a small change here and there. It is a whole paradigm shift, a shift in the way that we view things. We have to change our contentment gauge. We have to change the stuff that we look at when we try to determine whether our life is going well or not. This means stop trying to check your bank account to reassure you that everything's okay. Don't look to your 401k. Don't look to your follower account. Don't look to who's in office, who's in Congress, your physical appearance. Look to Jesus. Your relationship with the Lord, that's our way of gauging our life. How's your walk going? What's God teaching you right now? Because if you seek God, you will find him. So are you content? Be real with me. Are you really sitting there this morning? It's 2021, fresh start. This is the day we've been looking forward to for a year. Are you content? Content with your spouse, your family, your job? Singleness, appearance. Because if we're being honest, a lot of us walked in here this morning struggling with discontentment. Whether we know it or not. I mean, think about it with me. At the root of most of the things we struggle with is some form of discontentment. Overeating, pornography, obsessing over money, right? Checking your bank account more than your Bible. It may look different for everyone, but it's still discontentment. And then when you partake of whatever that is that you've been striving after for to fulfill yourself and it doesn't satisfy, it's like you got to get more because, oh, a little bit didn't work, so I need some more. And then that doesn't work and some more and some more and some more. And it's a spiral that never lets you off. Listen, there's freedom in Christ. To be content is to be satisfied with the giver and be free from craving the next gift. Contentment is freedom. It's looking around at all the world offers and going, nah, I'm good. What I have in Christ is more valuable than all of that. Can't buy it, can't earn it, wouldn't trade it for anything. You don't have to live in that spiral of discontentment, shame, and misery. Are you content in Christ? And as the band comes up, we're going to have a time of response. And I don't know where you're at this morning, but I do know that when we hear the word of God, we're called to respond. Maybe you need to get right with God this morning. Maybe you walked in discontent and you know it. You've been chasing after everything you can find and nothing's working and you're at the end of your rope. Maybe you walked in struggling with something that you didn't even realize was rooted in discontentment, but as you sat here and thought about it, you realize that you haven't been satisfied with life since you can remember. I don't know. I don't know where you're at. Maybe, maybe that is you, and maybe that means coming down and praying, praying in your seat. We're going to have people up here. Maybe you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time. You can't be content in Christ until you know Christ. But whatever it is, whatever the Lord is calling you to do, do it. Don't wait. Respond. Answer the Lord's call.